Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Paul's epistle to the Philippians, please. And we're in Paul's epistle to the Philippians, and we're turning to the third chapter. Philippians, and we're in chapter 3. And when we come to Philippians chapter 3, come down with me and we'll commence our reading at verse number 7. Philippians 3 and verse 7. And Paul the apostle writes and he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing upon the reading of his own precious truth for his name's sake. In the portion that we have read together, child of God, it is clearly seen that the Apostle Paul brings you and I to the center and to the core of Christianity. What we know as Christianity. In fact, the Apostle Paul, through this portion of Holy Scripture this morning, not only brings us to the center core of Christianity, but this portion of Holy Scripture this morning brings us to the heart and to the soul of Christian living. Paul brings us this morning in this passage to the heart and to the soul of Christian living. My dear friends this morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord, the central core of Christianity and the heart and soul of Christian living is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus this morning is the central core to Christianity. And the Lord Jesus Christ this morning is the heart and the soul of Christian living. The Lord Jesus is the heart and the soul of Christian living. What the Lord wants you and I to understand, child of God, is this, that the Lord Jesus should be the only object and is the only object of Christian life. He's the only object for Christian living. Do you remember what Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 21? He said, for me to live is Christ. Child of God, can you honestly say that this morning? Can I honestly say it? For me to live is Christ. Or I wonder what some of us have to honestly say it this morning, for me to live is my business. For to live, for me to live is myself. For me to live is anything and 
any other thing apart from Christ. Tell me something, child of God. Is Christ the heart and the soul of your Christian living? The Lord Jesus Christ. The fact is, child of God, this morning, Christ cannot be substituted by anything else. And Christ must never be substituted by any other thing else. And I want to take a wee moment this morning just to speak to the unsaved. Because here's what I want you to know, dear unsaved person, and it's something God wants you to know. The Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone is the only Savior of sinners. Christ alone is the only Savior of sinners. I want you to see, dear unsafe friend, this morning, as those nails were driven through the quivering flesh of Christ, it was for you. I want you to see him this morning, unsafe friend, as he's crowned with thorns, it was for you. I want you to see this morning his riven side where the soldiers drove the spear through. Listen, it was for you. And I want you to see this morning, dear unsafe friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he bore your sin in his own body upon the tree, as he bows his head and gives up the ghost, and he dies there, and his blood is shed. Let me tell you, unsafe friend, it was for you. He died that you may be forgiven. He died that, to make you good. He died that you may go at last to heaven, saved through His precious blood. Because I can tell you something now, dear own saved friend. If you're trusting in anything or other than Christ, you're going to hell. If you are trusting in anything or anyone else, you're going to hell. But my friend, God doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why He sent His Son to the cross, the Lord Jesus, to suffer and to bleed and to die for your sin, yes. Ah, but you know, friend, God so saw the work on the cross that it was perfectly finished, that God raised Him from the dead, and Christ, glory to God, is alive forevermore. But you need to trust Him as your Savior this morning. Because I can tell you there's no other substitute, there's no other, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. There's men in pulpits today taking Christ out of their preaching. Listen, if we don't preach Christ, we have no message. We have no message. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I want you unsaved, friend, listen, if you take nothing home from this message this morning, you take this home with you. Time is gliding swiftly by. Death and judgment draweth nigh to the arms of Jesus' fly. Be in time. Oh, I pray you count the cross or that fatal line be crossed and your soul in hell be lost, be in time. I want you to know, dear friend, Christ loves you. Died on the cross for you. And friend, this morning right now, he talks to you, saying to you, now come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He says to you this morning, I am the door by me. If any man enters in, shall be saved. Listen, unsafe friend. If you die without Christ, you're lost in hell, for he's the only Savior of sinners. That's not easy to say. But it's God's truth, and you need to obey God's truth. Christ is the only Savior. And to die without him, you'll be in hell, but to die with him, you'll be in heaven. And you know, dear child of God, this morning, Christ, he's the object for the Christian living, for me to live as Christ. He should be the heart and soul of your life, sister. He 
It should be the heart and soul of your life, brother. I'll tell you, in your Christian living, but I'll tell you, Christ isn't only the heart and soul of my Christian living. Do you want to know someone else? Christ is the heart and soul of my death. Amen. For me to live is Christ, yes. But do you see, to die, to die is gain. Glory to God for the believer. Dies, dying's not losing, dying's winning. Dying's gaining. And the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1, verse 23, Ah, oh, but I'm in a bit of a straight here. I'm going to fix. He says, I would rather depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Aye, far better. Do you know what makes heaven heaven? It's not the golden street, no. You know what makes heaven heaven? It's not the pearly gate, no. You know what makes heaven heaven? Christ. Christ is there. But you know, child of God, this morning as we come to our message, God's message this morning, we must get this into our hearts. Unless Christ is the object and the heart and the soul of your Christian living, we're not right. Fanny Crosby, my, one of my favorite hymn writers, says, Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Here's my text this morning. Listen to what Paul says in verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. And here's the text. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. You see, child of God, Paul's longing was to know Christ. Paul's longing was to be filled with Christ, not to be filled with Hebrew, not to be filled with Greek, not to be filled with oil theology, but to be filled with Christ this morning. Do you know why so many Christians today, they're living joyless lives, they're living powerless lives, they're living lifeless lives, because Christ is not for their living. Oh, child of God, maybe, maybe I'm speaking to one this morning. Listen, it's not me that's doing the speaking, it's the Lord using my voice. I wonder this morning, are you sluggish in your Christian life? Are you half dying in your Christian life this morning? There's no joy. There's no smile. There's no song this morning. Is it because Christ is pushed to the side? Ah, friend, Jesus is the joy for living. And Jesus, the joy of loving hearts. Because do you see, friend, this morning, if Christ this morning, the Lord Jesus, is not center to your Christian living, well, then you cannot live a joyful, wonderful Christian life because Christ won't be substituted to anybody. But the Apostle Paul longs for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, that I may win Christ and that I may know Christ. I wonder, do we really know him this morning, child of God? I, you believe him. You believe on him. Yes, you're trusting on him. It's one thing to believe on him. It's another thing to trust on him. But it's a different kettle of fish when it comes to knowing him, knowing Christ. And Paul describes it as the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. First of all, why is it excellent? It's excellent because it's a personal knowledge. Notice what Paul said in verse 10, that I may know him. Not that we may know him. This is something Paul could only do for himself. And listen, child of God, this is something that only you can do for yourself. This is something that only I can do for myself, and that is to know Him. Friend, I can't get to know Him through you, and you can't get to know Him through me. Friend, to be acquainted with Christ is to do that by our own selves. You know, dear child of God, this morning, when it comes to knowing Christ, tell me, are we close enough to know Him? So many of God's people, and here's the problem with modern-day Christian living. The problem with modern-day Christian living is this. 
we believe on Christ and we trust Christ for salvation. But salvation doesn't end there. We've got to know Him as well. Yes, you're saved already. But if you want to enter into a personal relationship with Christ, you've got to personally know Him for yourselves. That I may know Christ. I love the picture that we see in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 23. The twelve disciples are gathered in the upper room. The Lord Jesus is there. But in John 13, 23, we read, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. You know, they believe that this was John himself, the disciple John. But you know, the twelve were there. The twelve were there, but only one out of the twelve was really close enough to hear his heartbeat. Only one was close enough to really learn of Him and to know Him and to feel Him. Child of God, we need to be close this morning, personally close to feel Him. And we need to be personally close this morning to really get to know Him. Do you remember Mary? you remember the story of Mary and Martha? Before we go any further with Mary and Martha, everybody slams Martha and gives Mary all the praise. But don't you forget this, this morning, child of God. It was Martha. It wasn't Mary, but Martha that brought the Lord into the house. It was Martha that received him. It was Martha that brought him in. It was Martha that sat him down so that Mary could sit at his feet. Sometimes it takes the Marthas of life to cause the light to shine that little bit brighter on the Marys. Wander along this morning, child of God, you're at his feet. Getting to know him. Preparing your heart with him. Preparing your soul with him. Preparing your mind with him personally as you come to worship him this morning. It's a personal knowledge. It's a knowledge this morning that only comes from those tonight, this morning that lean upon him. It's only when you really, like John, lean on the Lord, you know. When you lean on the Lord like John, you know, you get to know his goodness. You get to know more of his grace. You get to know more of his mercy. You get to know more of his goodness. And Paul says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's a personal knowledge. It's an intellectual knowledge. That's what makes it excellent this morning. It's an intellectual knowledge. I want to say something, and I say this from personal experience. Get to know Christ yourself. Get to know Christ yourself. And get to know Christ intellectually through His Word. There's too many reading the views of men and commentaries. And not every commentary is right. Because I can tell you now there's a lot of baloney been written. And it's not truth at all, for it's only a load of tripe, half of it. You get to know Christ intellectually for yourself through his own word. There's enough in the word of God for you to really get to know him this morning. And this morning we need to push commentaries to the side. We're too busy and we're looking what other men think. And looking what other men say. Listen, learn Christ for yourself through his word. 
Just because other men say this and other men differ on me on that, it doesn't mean they're right. What you do, you get to learn Christ intellectually through His own infallible truth. This is God's Word. And we should never substitute God's Word with anything. Because it's the Word that shows us Christ. It's the Word that speaks to us from Christ. It's the Word that illuminates Christ before us. The Word of God. Oh, we need to get to know Him intellectually. Do you remember Pilate? Pilate and the dying thief. For all the time they had to learn with Christ, this is one thing they got to know about him. He was the sinless Son of God. The Pilate can have to say, I find no fault in this man. That's how much he knew about him. And then the dying thief, he's hanging there beside him, and he's looking at him, and he's wondering who he is, but he gets to know this about him. He gets to know that this man has done nothing amiss. Even the centurion stand at the foot of the cross, you know. He was stood and he looked up and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. You know, friend, you have to be close to him, to know him. And you need to get to know him through his word. Listen, don't you substitute the word of God for commentaries. You've got to know him yourself. Pilate said, the sinless Christ. Mary and Martha, they learned him to be the sympathetic Christ. The disciples in the boat, they saw him as the sovereign Christ. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Ah, oh, dear child of God, this morning, let's this morning count all everything else but lost this morning. Let's really get to know Christ the way we ought to know him. Ah, oh, yes. Remember this, to know Him is to love Him. Too many of God's people over the years, they spent more times looking to ministers and looking to great preachers and looking to pastors. In fact, if the truth were told, the pastors almost became Christ to them because they put them on the pedestal rather than Christ. And I can tell you over the years, when men died, certain men died on the way they died, they didn't know where they were. And they didn't know some of them whether they were saved or not. Because them men took the place of Christ in their lives and in their hearts. That's hard to say, but it's true. There's men in this province and they followed him for years. And preachers and pastors followed them for years. I'll tell you, when you follow Christ, you'll not go wrong. Oh, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. It's an intellectual knowledge, friend. You've got to know Him and got to know Him personally. And you've got to not only know Him personally, get close to Him and learn all about Him. But I'll tell you something else, friends, this morning. It's not only an intellectual knowledge and a personal knowledge. You remember this. It's a devotional knowledge. As I have already said, to know Him is to love Him. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. I was reading in 1 Peter the other day, 1 Peter 1, verse 8, we read, whom having not seen you love. Peter was writing to persecuted Christians. And he had to commend them, listen, whom you have never seen you love. I have saw him and I love him, but you love him because you have, and you haven't even saw him. And that's true this morning. And Peter was writing, listen, you love Christ because you know Christ, but you've never seen Christ. You know, friend, us men, you don't fall in love with anybody until you certainly know something about them. Isn't that right? I know I didn't fall head over heels in love in the first 24 hours. There was things I wanted to know about Tracy before I fell in love with her. 
I wanted to know first of all what you crabbed. I wanted to know first of all what you be bossy. Should have looked a wee bit closer that one. <laughs> but there's things I wanted to know before I fell in love. You're all right, Liz. God, he was first love at first sight. He was. Ah, but my friends, the Lord Jesus this morning, I haven't seen him, but I have seen him. Do you know how I've seen him? I have saw him through his word. How I see the Lord Jesus is seen through his word, not on the words of men, but on the words of God. One of the loveliest pictures of devotional knowledge is found in the Gospels. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, 26. In verse 12, you remember the Lord Jesus. He's in the house at Bethany. Remember, he's there in the home of Simon the leper. And you remember in verse 7, there's a woman comes. And she breaks open the alabaster box and pours it upon his head. Do you remember the disciples' reaction to that? They were filled. It actually says it in the Word of God. It says they were filled with indignation because of the great waste. Do you know why that was? Because that woman knew more about Christ than the disciples. Let me repeat that. That woman knew more of Christ than the disciples. And here's the fact. Because the Lord Jesus said she did. Do you know what the Lord Jesus said? He said, For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. That woman that day in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany, she knew more about the death and burial of Christ than the disciples. And that was a devotional act of love that she poured upon him that ointment. That's why she did it. Because she knew all about the death of Christ. Child of God, here's, here's the sticky wicket. This morning, do you really love Christ? How well do you know Christ? If there's one moment in the week that proves how much you know him and how you love him, is at this table. This table displays our love for Christ. I, to know him is to love him, but what better way this morning to love him than to gather around the Lord's table? As we gather around the Lord's table, we're devotionally worshiping the Lord the same way the woman did when she poured the ointment upon him, because we do this in remembrance of his death. And child of God this morning, tell me this, how well do you know Christ this morning? How well do you love Christ? Because this table above all things, proves our love for him. Some churches I would have went to, if I had read from the NIV, they would have kicked me out of the pulpit. And I'm an authorized version man anyway. I just stick to the authorized version. But there's a lot of churches I would have preached in before I came here. See, if I'd have read from the NIV, you'd have been the worst in the world. You'd have been called apostate and everything. 
But do you see the same people who would give off to me because I would have read from the NIV or maybe said something or maybe anything else? Those people who would have almost put me out through the door. They themselves never once stayed to wait to remember the Lord. There's something wrong, child of God. And I'll tell you what's wrong because the Lord has told me to say this. We don't know the Lord and we don't love the Lord the way we ought. I don't care what Hebrew and Greek and all the rest of it, and English and geography and all that, I don't care about that. I don't care about how well you know your Bible. The whole thing is how well do I know Christ? And for those this morning of us who wait at the Lord's table, tell me this this morning. Why is it it's only the chosen few? Well, it's not the chosen few. How is it it's the same few that can only give thanks? Why is it the same half dozen, if we have half a dozen, that will give a simple word of thanks at the Lord's table? It's not any exposition we need. Just a simple word of thanks. Do you know why that is? Because I don't really think we know Him. The way we ought to know Him. When Jackie Hughes was in Koch Baptist, there was one morning he had to wait for a long time for some brother to give thanks for the bread, and he says, maybe some sister would like to give thanks. Half a dozen men were on their feet right away. They were on their feet right away, but it was for the wrong reasons. It was to keep the sisters down. I want to ask you this morning, child of God, and, and listen, brethren, I'm talking to you this morning. You don't have to be a deacon or an elder to give thanks. The grounds for which you can give thanks is that you know and trust Christ and that you love Him. There's no excuse as to why you cannot give thanks, brother, but the only excuse is, I know you don't know Christ the way you ought to know Him. But I'm going to finish with this thought. Paul the Apostle this morning, he longs for the excellency knowledge of Christ Jesus because it's personal, intellectual, devotional. Let me tell you something now. It's joyful. It's joyful. The more you know Christ, the more joyful you be. Boy, it does my head, and when I see Christians walking about, with faces on them like a lurking spade. With no joy, no peace. To really know Christ is to know joy. Peter said, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Do you see joy? Do you see happiness? Do you see peace? Those are only three of the many fruits that comes from really knowing Christ. How oh, more about Jesus would I know? Ah, that's the longing that should be in our hearts. And every time you open your Bible, dear, that should be the longing in your heart. More about Jesus! And that should be the longing in your heart too, brother. More about Jesus! In His Word! More about Jesus! More about Jesus, would I know? And dear child of God, this morning, listen to me. Peter in the day, in a second epistle 3, verse 18, says this. He wrote it in the day when there's false teaching. This is what he said as he finished the epistle. But grow in grace. 
and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that because if you read the second epistle of Peter, the great problem was false teaching. I'll tell you, we're living in a day where there's a lot of false teaching and it's creeping into the churches. And as long as I'm here by the grace of God, it won't be here. And the only way you'll guard yourself from false teaching is to grow in grace and to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. May Christ this morning be the heart and soul of your Christian life, sister. And may the Lord Jesus be the heart and soul of our Christian life, brother. May it be so. Christ only. For me to live as Christ. May that 